we'll give them just another minute. Hello everyone and welcome to the Bread Bakers Guild of America after school special known as Avoiding the Postmortem. That was Rebecca Miller's clever title and I really like it. Today we have Amy Sherber of Amy's Bread in New York City. Amy founded Amy's Bread in 1992, one year before the Bread Bakers Guild of America. We have Amy Emberling from Zingerman's Bake, managing partner from Zingerman's Bakehouse in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Amy was really an academic, ac help me, academian, academic, academic, until she, with degrees from Harvard, from Cordon Bleu, from everywhere before she came, she started at Zingerman's and came back to Zingerman's in, I think 2001 or 2000? 2000. 2000. Mm -hmm. 2000. That's when we met. Scott Francis is with it. Scott France is with us from Macrina Bakery founded by Leslie Mackey in 1993 or two? Scott, 93. Um, they have five bakery cafes in the city or in the area. And then we have Josh Allen of Companion Bread in St. Louis established in 1993. Um, I love what you said on your website that you're in the business of baking bread, but you're also in the business of supporting small growers and producers and establishing relationships. This subject of avoiding the postmortem and these uh, great business people sharing their key performance indicators with us and how they measure them and what they do with those measurements really sprung out of a, um, an event we did with Josh and a few other people on scaling up. So Josh, I'm gonna turn it over to you because I'm just bumbling and I'm gonna let it go from there. Thanks, Mitch. No, I'm thrilled to be here, and, and you're right. It, it, it stemmed out of the, the, the Scaling Up webinar that we did a couple months back, and we found that most of the questions, and actually I had a number of folks follow up with me offline in regards to key performance indicators and numbers that we were looking at and kind of why we measured them and how we measured them. And so we thought we would put something together and, and take some folks with a, a handful of years of experience and we were all gonna just spend a couple of minutes talking about three or four of the key measurements that we look at. Um, I'll start, we'll go, th we'll go through mine, we'll, we'll kind of pass it around and then uh, we'll open it up for questions at the end because really this isn't, this isn't about us, it's about, it's about folks that are listening and if there's anything that we can, we can pass on from the experiences that we've had and, and we've certainly had quite a few of them and have measured a lot of things in the past, um, some of which have been valuable and some of which have not. So I was gonna share three key things. You know, We look at, at some numbers that really work in concert with one another. One of the things that, that you really gotta be careful about is, is I do believe that what gets measured gets managed. And if you're not careful, you start measuring something that, that takes you in the wrong direction because folks are in general trying to do the right thing and trying to help. And sometimes if you start you know, driving a, a performance indicator that may negatively affect quality or negatively affect customer service or something, you just have to be very conscious of that. So we look at three efficiency things here at Companion. Um, and we have during the, the, the pandemic, kind of leading into and during the pandemic, we've transitioned the majority of our business to frozen. So I should say that as kind of where we are as a company, we produce between 25 and 30,000 pounds of bread a day, primarily um, frozen product that's shipped from the Rocky Mountains to the Appalachian Mountains. So we're not national, but we're kind of regional in, in what we do. And, and the three things that are really important to me that we look at, one is when we look at a production efficiency is fill rate. So we look at the percentage of cases in our, in our instance, but for you, it could be loaves, it could be pounds, the, the percentage of cases that we actually ship to our customers versus the ones that they actually order. So if, we sh if customers order 
a thousand cases and we only ship 900, we would have a 90% fill rate. And it's a, we look at it both on a, on a short term, like how's the last month been and on how, and also on a rolling yearly average, because we kind of sort of have to be able to tell the story from a sales perspective on a little broader scale for our customers in terms of how do we do in general. But then obviously with the pandemic, um, we've had a lot of volatility in our labor force and it's kind of really wreaked havoc on our fill rate. So our goal in fill rate is 99% because again, we're a frozen manufacturer. So we have a little longer, a 10 to 14 day lead time. And if a customer orders something, um, you know, 10 to 14 days out, they have an expectation and we have an expectation that we're going to fill that order uh, with everything that they've asked for. And uh, in the last year, our, our average has been in the low to mid 90s. We've really struggled a little bit with that over the year, but in the, on a monthly basis, it's been as low as 85 or 87 percent, especially as we've grown out of the pandemic and our business is returning, but we haven't been able to as quickly rehire folks and train folks and, and everything else. And um, you know, the big thing for me is the, the question that it answers for me is, are we over promising and under delivering? So are we taking an order that for any number of reasons we not, might not be able to fill because over time that's gonna affect our long-term credibility. So our salespeople and, and myself need to be able to talk to folks about what our fill rate is because they need to be able, our customers need to be able to trust us that if we say we're gonna do something that we're gonna be able to do it. And, and fill rate really is the best answer to that. So I always use the example with our bakers here, it's like going to a restaurant. If you go to your favorite steakhouse every week and you love the filet and every week the, the waiter says to you, you know what, that's I, I, me, I love it too, but we're out of the filet today. So do you wanna try the strip steak? And you go, well, okay, I'll try it this week, but boy, I really love the filet. And you go back the next week and they're out of the filet again. Eventually you're gonna lose credibility. They're gonna lose credibility and you're gonna stop going to that restaurant. And what we have to be careful of is, is folks stop buying from us because we're telling them that we're going to do something and we're not doing it. So fill rate is a, is a hugely important thing. There's a, a local grocery store chain here that we do business with, but we've talked to them. They're having trouble finding cake decorators right now. And they realize that they could decorate 200 cakes a week. And anytime they took more orders than that, they just weren't doing it. And, and little Johnny on his birthday wasn't getting a cake. So they realized that they needed to just stop taking orders after 200. Um, and until they can hire and find more people and find more help, that's what their capacity is. And so they shouldn't take orders greater than that, because if that fill rate number really starts to fall, they'll lose credibility and they'll lose long term customers. So that's our big one from a uh, from a production efficiency standpoint. Another one that we look at, and I talked a little bit on the, on the scaling up seminars, trash for me is a big one, uh, both environmentally, but also philosophically and, and kind of as it affects everything that we're doing, we've been, we've been measuring our trash now for about three years and we look at our trash efficiency score. So we take our sales every month and we divide it by the total number of pounds of trash that we generate and we come up with what we call our trash efficiency score. Um, now we like charts to go up instead of going down. So if we just looked at pounds and the number was going down, that's great, but the chart looks, looks like it's back. It looks like we're not doing well. So we, we flip it on its head and divide it into sales. But in the end, we want to drive that number up. So we want to make sure that we're selling more things and more dollars per every pound of trash that we're generating. It answers a lot of questions for me as, it, as more so than just gross margin would. Um, you know, obviously labor is affected, you know, trash affects labor, trash affects ingredients. Sometimes it affects packaging, depending on when you have to discard something. Um, but it also has a big impact on morale in terms, you know, everybody comes to work every day wanting to make a great product. And if something's underbaked, overbaked, underweight, overweight, or out of spec for any reason, and that product has to either be donated, discarded, composted, or whatever, if it's not getting to the customer, it does have an impact, you know, philosophically and psychologically on the bakers. And that does long-term affect them as it relates to, um, as it relates to retention. We found that the better we can do with our trash efficiency score, the more satisfied people are with their work and the better they feel about how things are going. Um, and it's also a leading indicator as to, are we planning well? Are we making improvements? Are we doing a better job in, in production planning? Because we're not trying to cram a bunch of stuff through um, in a short period of time and, and generating a lot of waste in that. And it's also a nice, you know, it's a nice counterbalance to that production efficiency, that fill rate, because if we're chasing our tail with our fill rate and trying to, you know, scramble out and take care of our customer, sometimes then we'll also see, you know, if our fill rate goes down, we generally see our trash rate go up um, and we got to keep those two things in balance. 
And then quickly, the third one that we look at is a quality efficiency. So it's another way to look at, again, we take the number of complaints that come into the bakery and we measure complaints. We have a QA a gentleman here who, who manages quality assurance and responds to customers, you know, complaints, be it a, a grocery customer or a distributor, an end user, whoever that might be. But we track those complaints and we go through our system, figure out what happened, get a response out to the customer and make sure that they're satisfied with what we're going to do to make sure it doesn't happen again. But we also take those complaints and divide it into sales and come up with what we kind of call our quality efficiency. So that does another job to balance out the trash efficiency, because if, if somebody was just trying to reduce trash, they might ship product that was below standard, and eventually down the road, we would get a complaint about that. So we have to make sure that, that again, if we're measuring trash, that we're not incentivizing our team to send out poor quality product. So we try to use all these things in concert with one another to stay efficient and to, and to keep going. So... Those are the three key performance indicators that we look at, kind of why we look at it and how we look at it. And I am going to turn it over to Amy Sherber in New York City and see what she's got to say. Hi, everybody. Um, it's fun to see all of you together here. And um, I just want to talk about my thing is called back to basics. So as Mitch said, most of us have been in business since 92 or 93. My business was kind of a medium-sized business. I had about 170 employees before the pandemic started, and there were at least 70 people baking. And you know, managers, quite a few managers around the bakery, at least 16 in the pastry kitchen, lots of retail employees, and you know, a lot of office staff. And once the pandemic hit, um, we really knew that we had to lay off more than 100 people. My husband runs the financial side, and he and I talked about should we stay open or closed. And then we decided, you know, we really had to let these people go. And it was really awful. But at the same time, we knew we had to get back to the basics and really trim back the way we did everything. And since we had such a small crew, we started looking at some of the reports that we had never looked at before because um, to use a lot more elaborate reports and we would compare retail stores, this store versus that store and location and number of customers per hour and all these different things. But now we had no customers and we had... You know, we had nothing really I had to go way back to the beginning. And um, in the beginning of that pandemic, I started doing the purchasing and then managing the whole production staff. So I knew a lot of the facts anyway, but I decided to start looking at this. Uh, one of the reports that I really liked was this simple report. Um, let's see. Sorry, here we go. So it's a report of the sales. This is a from during the pandemic. So it's not our current sales, thankfully, <laughs> it was a while ago. But I just want to give you an example. I don't want to share the today's numbers. But in any case, you can just look at each day of the week and you can take it for as much as long a period as you want to. But um, this is something that's in our, our system. And so I can see like, okay, you know, the day before is when we actually make this stuff. Which day do I need three people? I need four people. I need six people. And I can really see where we have a pop in our business by the week and by the day so that, you know, I'm, I'm not there around the clock. I don't know that every night, which nights are really, really busy for the pastry kitchen or something where I can't tell why, you know, they're getting done so late. So I see these numbers. It helps me to make my schedules. And I, I really liked using it. And I can look ahead and say like, wow, look at how we're doing compared to like two months ago during the pandemic when we really had, we went up by $15,000 in a few weeks. You know, that's pretty amazing. And look at how, how much everyone's chipping in to help make this happen. So I really like this report. And again, it's a simple report. Um, it's there for you know, every day, every week of the year, but I had never tried using it before. Um, the other thing that I guess really helped was just looking back at the simple and simple numbers. And um, Troy, my husband, has been working hard to get the financial reports done right after the month is over with. So we moved from one month to another. And um, I took an example of a simple report that we use, which is just the company KFI overall, the bread, the bread kitchen, pastry kitchen, and the retail stores, each one's a separate profit center. But um, again, I took a month that was really slow. It's not our normal sales, thankfully. And um, I separated it off. Usually on the left side, you'll see last year's sales and total sales and monthly sales. And on the right, you'll see this year's total sales. But when I look at this, I just know, okay, well, here we're losing $63,000 that month, which wasn't very good. But in any case, um, my food cost was pretty good. It was below 17%. And my goal is to be under 17%. And if I'm there, I know I'm going to be okay because this is 16.4. So that was actually good for what we were selling. When I look down further, I look at my salaries. That's the biggest cost for us and for most of you, I'm sure. 
and um, the regular salaries before benefits was at 54%. And then with benefits, it got up to 63%. Now that's unsustainable. There's no way that we would ever be profitable with that high of labor costs. So if I'm 55% or less for the total between direct salaries and then benefits, usually that shows me that I'm going to be okay. We're going to be hitting break even. We're going to be, be you know, getting back to a uh, positive side. And then when I look at overhead, again, last year, there's no way that our costs could ever make up for like the, you know, the regular rent, the Con Edison bills and all those things. But if I hit 30% or less, usually, or we do as a company with our overhead, we feel that we can pretty much know that we're going to be um, at a point where we're breaking even or moving into a profitable area. So with this information then I need to spend time focusing on what am I buying? What's my purchase and what's our, our team? What are we using? You know, again, like some of Josh's ideas about waste come into play when you're looking at your ingredient costs and your labor costs, it's a big area where waste can happen, but the tighter you schedule and you follow your other instincts and reports, you can keep your payroll cost in your, your range so that you can hit your numbers. Um, with these things, these reports, I think over this last year, really looking at this, and then I have separate ones for each retail store, I was able to, or my husband and I were able to really look at, you know, which things were sustainable and how it was interesting. Certain stores really came forward from being busier than they used to be and others were behind. But um, going back to simpler reports without a lot of bells and whistles, I didn't have time to look at any other reports and I didn't have anybody else who was even working here to look at them. So I was like, this is it. This is all I need is the simplest stuff. And it really answered our questions and helped us to make the right decisions. You know, and as we go, along, things have gotten better, luckily. So um, the numbers are coming back up out of these negative places. <laughs> and hopefully they are for all of you as well. And um, so that's my back to basics. And now I wanna pass it on to whoever wants to speak next. Hey, Scott, would you be willing to speak next? Because I, I feel like mine is sort of more general about how to share information. And so maybe after we do all the metrics, it makes kind of the most logical sense. That sounds great. I'm happy to go. Uh, I'm happy to go next. Um, first of all, thank you, uh, Mitch and Josh, for, for including me. I'm honored to be in with this group of great business people and bakers. So um, I'm Scott. I've been working and running Macarena since about 2007. Uh, many of you know Leslie, our founder, who's been uh, on the Bread Breakers Guild board, and we've been involved for many, many years. Um, our bakery currently has 225 employees, and before the pandemic, that was over 300. So I certainly recognize some of the pain that uh, others have felt over this last year. Um, as Mitch mentioned, we have five cafes in and around Seattle. Um, at which we serve breads and pastries and also breakfast and lunch items that we make in our centralized savory department's kitchen. Um, we kept our cafes open throughout the pandemic. Uh, three of the five probably didn't have enough business to justify it, but uh, we were simply trying to keep as many jobs as possible. Um, and when we, re when we received some PPP assistance from the federal government, we felt, we felt good about that decision. Um, our wholesale business uh, covers a range of about 40 miles in every direction from Seattle, 45 minutes to an hour, give, it, give or take. Um, we have about 700 customers that we're delivering to over the course of a four-week period. Obviously, not all of those 700 customers are ordering every day, um, but many of them do. Um, Pre-pandemic, our wholesale sales categories were kind of 30% grocery, 30% cafe, 30% restaurant. Um, the remaining 10% was a combination of hotel and catering. Um, and right now we're heavily grocery as many of our restaurant and cafe customers are still struggling to come out of the, out of the pandemic. Um, so as Amy suggested, we've seen some pretty significant growth over the last few weeks. Um, so much so that, uh, um, getting everyone back and hiring people is a, is a challenge to make sure we can fulfill, fulfill our customers' orders. So. Um, we have a lot going on, but there's obviously a, a light at the end of the tunnel that we're excited about. Um, some of the things that I want to talk about today um, really revolves around people and keeping people. Uh, one of the things we look at is turnover and tenure. 
Uh, we have a goal of a 10 year average tenure for all of our employees of 4.5 years. Uh, we had never achieved that goal um, until the pandemic. Unfortunately, we did achieve it uh, when we had to lay off people and many of those layoffs were um, uh, more focused on newer employees than long-term employees. Um, so right now we're at 4.8 years. Um, we believe keeping people longer is really great for the bakery and also really good for the people. So um, we, we, are, we are focused on figuring out ways to make that happen as much as possible. Uh, turnover is tracked as well, but we don't really have a goal for it. Um, turnover is just so that we all have the same definition, or at least you know the definition I'm using, is the number of inactive employees over the last 13 periods or 12 months divided by the current number of employees in that location or department. So right now we're at 39.7%. Um, which means people are sticking around for a little while. Um, average tenure and turnover are different things, though related. Um, you can have high turnover and high average tenure if you're hiring lots of people and they're churning out quickly as well. So um, finding those right people that are going to stick around for long term uh, is what we're focused on in this goal. Um, and one of the ways we do that, or two things I want to talk about are mission and core values as being integral to our culture. So we talk about these all the time. They're part of our new hire conversation. They're part of orientation. We're super explicit about what our mission is, what our core values are. And we try to push really hard to make sure that the people that wanna work for us or that we're trying to hire or that we are looking, that we wanna work for us, that these resonate with them. Uh, because if they do, that's great. They can have long-term success at Macrina. Uh, and if they don't, that's totally fine but then Macrina isn't the right place. So we really try not to hire out of desperation, which we certainly have done in the past and maybe even be doing now, uh, given our current status, but we really try to focus on mission and core values. Uh, one of our core values is embracing diversity. So we have a large Vietnamese um, and Spanish speaking population. So we have all of our documents translated into Vietnamese and Spanish. We also have a, a significant Somali uh, population um, and we have some literacy issues so we bring in an interpreter for those meetings to make sure that we can communicate directly with employees um, and it's been it's been great here is an example of uh, one of the um, things that we did when we rolled it out and i'm gonna mess this up somehow um, sorry that's not working just so you can see what we're talking about. So here is our, um, one of our core values is integrity in all we do. So this is obviously the English version of what we had, uh, but when we rolled this out, we have these posters up in all of our locations, all their, our departments with not only what the core value is, but how, how it can resonate or make sense to people doing this every day. Um, and then we post it in, in the different languages, as I suggested. So um, some of you might recognize Jane there from uh, um, previous, uh, previous Fred Baker's Guild stuff. So, um, so that's one of the things that we do to try to boost up that average tenure um, and reduce turnover. Uh, another thing we do are our annual surveys. So we send out surveys to every employee in the company every year. Uh, we did not do it during the pandemic. I am still bummed that that didn't happen. Uh, these are anonymous. They are tabulated. Uh, they are sent to a third party where they are tabulated. They are sent out in English, Vietnamese, and Spanish. And then we follow up the the surveys when they're filled out with uh, meetings with myself and all of each department in each location with kind of their leadership team manager to go over the survey results and then also talk about how things can happen or how things, excuse me, how we can do things better and how to make those things happen. Um, the results are important for the survey. Uh, the, you know, most of the questions are, at, we're asked to rank us out of five and we are, we average 4.3 almost every year without exception. Um, but the real magic is, is in these meetings. Um, and what we promise is that if you have a question or if you have a suggestion, we will absolutely respond to it. Even if the answer is, Thank you for the feedback. We're not going to do that, uh, but everyone really wants to know that they've been heard. And so we focus on listening. We focus on taking the feedback and then making sure that we respond. Um, we have a kind of a separate survey that goes out to the managers. And then, you know, I have those meetings with different manager levels. 
Um, and those are often, those are also really, really great. And we make decisions based on this feedback. Um, and uh, we, we think that over time, this is, uh, this is what helps that average, average turnover number. Um, a couple other things that I just wanted to mention, uh, growth is important in Macrina, not for growth sake, but because it allows us to provide opportunities for, um, for people. We want people to stick around. We want them to make this their career. Uh, we have three people as part of our leadership team now, um, all of whom started as hourly employees, and now they're, you know, running big portions of the business and have, you know, uh, tens, if not hundreds of people reporting to them. Uh, it's really cool to see. So having that growth is important. And one of the, one of the metrics we look at are initial customer sales for wholesale. Um, we want, we want obviously big customers, but we want slow, steady growth. We don't want massive changes overnight. We, we can't do that very well. Um, our minimum delivery for a brand new customer is 35 bucks a day, but really we want folks at around $50. Um, and if it's a grocery store where we're spending a bunch of time inside the grocery store, we're hoping for closer to 100. Um, so uh, some of those numbers are pretty small, um, but we've really kind of uh, decided to keep those numbers low so that we can invest in the future potential of some of these wholesale customers. Um, we, we don't always achieve this, uh, but we work really hard to uh, kind of continue, continue that growth going. Um, and then the last thing I would say as a key metrics is that profitability is a must. Um, we all work too hard for the numbers not to be positive, albeit there's a big caveat for the last year. Um, so we don't discount our product except for kind of short-term promotional things with grocery stores or for fundraising things. Um, we don't do buybacks. There's already too much waste in the system. Um, and so we just flat out say no. Um, um, and then we raise price. We raise prices at regular intervals. In our cafes, we do it every year. Uh, for wholesale, we do it about every three years, um, just to try to stay positive. So uh, it's painful. Sometimes customers are not happy, uh, but in general, they understand what's going on, um, and they're raising their prices too, which they have to do. So um, those are kind of the metrics that I want to talk about. And I'm always happy to share kind of more information. Uh, offline or one-on-one -on -one if anyone wants to go into more details. Thank you very much. Great. That was so interesting to listen to all three of you. And I feel honored to be here. Um, I wish that we could get together more often. I have learned things just from listening in this short little bit of time. And I'm hoping that everyone else who's listening has learned something too. Um, so many of us, when we, we got together before today to kind of think about, uh, you know, who wanted to share what metrics, obviously we shared a wide variety of them, but there are lots of metrics that we all had in common also. So in, I thought that might, might be interesting to share with all of you is sort of how we actually use the metrics at Zingerman's Bakehouse. Uh, what's the process and to what degree the staff is involved? Because a big part of our culture, which also sounds like at Macrina's and maybe the others too, we just didn't hear about that, is having a lot of participation, a lot of ownership of the business, or at least a great sense of ownership. And that's been very important to us. So we practice something that's called um, open book management. And I want to kind of describe what that is. And let's see, I'm just going to share my screen with you somewhat so that I can... Uh, make sure that I see everything that I wanted to say. So uh, in, in just the next few minutes, I want to kind of explain uh, what open book management is, why we bother to do it, and kind of what it looks like day to day so you could have a sense of it, and then how to get started. So if, there's, if you're interested and you think this is something that would work really well in your bakery, then, or with your department, if you're leading an area, or even if you wanna kind of generate it with a small team of people that you're working with, what you might do in order to make that happen. So what is open book management? I am going to uh, look at that. This is a definition. It came from uh, an organization called the Great Bank Game of Business. We did not make up open book management at Zingerman's at all. And if you're interested, the Great Game is a great uh, resource. It's actually in St. Louis. So I'm sure that Josh is super familiar with them. It was started uh, by a group of people, uh, employees who actually bought out a manufacturing plant that was uh, not doing well and they wanted to keep their jobs. And then they came up with this sort of practice of sharing information. 
So as the definition says, uh, it's the a business practice of creating transparency by sharing financial information with employees. So I wanna stop there for a minute. It says financial information, definitely lots of the metrics that we've already spoken about are financial. And I think that's important to share them, but we also heard a variety of metrics that aren't uh, just sort of financial in nature, they're management metrics. And so it's just as important to um, share those. It includes financial inf uh, education for your employees and showing them how their production influences the finances. So this is a really critical part. Uh, it's really easy that you can say, oh, our books are open and anybody can look at our PL or they can look at our balance sheet. But if people don't understand what it means, it really doesn't matter that they can look at it. So a big part of practicing open book management is taking the time to actually teach people what all these metrics mean and most importantly, how they can impact them from the, their day to day work. Uh, and then as the definition continues, it says it's an easy to learn and fun management system intended to be a discipline that's developed over time rather than being a one time fix. So absolutely, oh, practicing open book is sort of, it becomes a part of the culture and you can begin at it and, and in the way that it's a practice, maybe you're not necessarily that good or skilled or you do it in a small way, but over time you can, the whole organization learns and can get better at it and it can become a bigger part of the culture. So that's one way that's a very sort of technical way of thinking about what is open book management. On simpler terms, think about it. I like to think about it this way and describe it in this way. It's like just telling people what the rules of the game are. So you can imagine if you were playing a card game or a sports game and you didn't know what the rules were and you didn't know how the score was being kept, it would be very difficult to know how to perform in a way that would be effective and you would have no idea whether you're doing a good job or not. So why in, in American businesses, we wouldn't really wanna share these things so that people can do a better job, I don't really understand. So basically the practice of open book is explaining to people what the rules of the game are and helping people to understand what the different strategies are so that they can actually use them in the day-to-day -day of their work. So, let me, oh, I'm having trouble switching my screen. Oh, there we go. So why practice it? Okay. Number one, it gives every, what I just said, it gives everyone on the team the information that they need to do their jobs effectively. So we might talk about, you know, food cost in a business. But if we don't, if we say to people, oh, the food cost was really high this month, but we don't explain to them where that number comes from and then how they can impact it, it's, a, it's not very helpful or meaningful. So when you practice open book, you could explain the many thing, many factors to people that might be impacting the food cost. And it, once they know that, they can really have the ability to make a difference in their job. The overall goal of practicing open book is that it should give you an improvement on all of your bottom line performances. So it's not sort of a practice to do just because it's nice to do. It really should improve um, your business. And I think that it really makes the work more meaningful for everyone. So as a leader in our organization, I spend a lot of time here with people, probably most of my life is spent with everyone. I would love for it to be a meaningful experience for them. And when I'm on a team, I wanna be playing with other people who know what the game is and are enjoying themselves and are learning and growing. And so for all of us together, it can be uh, a much more uh, meaningful overall time. And then finally, it really allows us to kind of share the stress of work, especially in a year that we, like we've just had, uh, I think that the fact that so many people had a high level of financial literacy in the bakery really helped everyone understand right from the beginning what was possibly going on and to work together to try to improve um, the possibilities of any of our outcomes. And then when you have successes, one of the one of the ways that open book also works is you tend to share in the success. So we have different ways that we share financially with the team. Um, and so, you know, that's great. They get, we get to play the game together and we get to win together. And when we're not winning, we get to work together in order to figure out how to improve things. Let's go back. So what does it look like day to day? Because sometimes when I talk about open book with people, they think, oh, well, you know, this sounds like it's a lot of work. 
basically on the day-to-day, -day, it is not so much work. We, in each area of our bakery, we have weekly meetings that we call huddles. They're for, you know, about 15 minutes and they're done standing. You know, remember I said it came from a manufacturing environment. And so they had teams of people that would be standing on the manufacturing floor. And then they had boards that we called departmental operating reports that were just whiteboards where they would have key metrics written down where they could share them. So we have those meetings once a week in each area, 15 minutes, go over the key metrics that that team chose together. Uh, they report on what happened last week, what's the plan for uh, next week, and then what do we forecast? What do we think is going to happen? And then they discuss amongst themselves, you know, what are we gonna to do to make sure that we actually deliver on what we're forecasting? Uh, so that's the basic, you know, sort of foundation of what, you know, what really has to happen. But because people are be becoming really literate in the key metrics of the business, you'll also see a lot of discussions just during work about, you know, different things. What's going on with labor cost? Uh, we have some uh, a metric called missed opportunities where we don't deliver sort of like the fill rate that Josh was talking about. Why are missed opportunities so high this week or why were they low? Uh, there's a little bit of board management that has to go on. So I referred to this board and I'm going to show you a couple of pictures of them to make sure that the information is well communicated. And then there is both some formal and informal teaching that has to happen so that people really understand uh, what the metrics mean. Okay, so here's a picture of a huddle in action. This happens to be at Zingerman's Roadhouse. You can, you know, just team members sitting in a room. It's a dining room of a restaurant and you see these big whiteboards up there. It looks, it looks a little overwhelming um, from this picture, but it doesn't have to be that complicated. They've been doing this for many years. So that's why it looks like that. And here's an example of, I have a couple of examples of boards. So this one is very nice and neat and clean. And you see that on um, the left-hand side, there are the key measures. So wholesale sales, retail sales, total sales, there's uh, net operating profit is in there, food costs, we have cash. We haven't spoken about that in this call today. Uh, you'll see lower down hours donated because in our organization, donating time, volunteering is very important. There's a metric of energy, you know, sort of how are people feeling? And then at the top of the board, you'll see week one, week two, week three, so the weeks of the month. And then you see the letters uh, P, F, and A. So what's the plan? What did we say we were gonna do in our sort of budgeting? What are we forecasting? And then what's the actual? So each week there would, uh, somebody would own each one of these lines, they'd meet in their huddle, go through these lines and um, report on the numbers. Here's another board. This is one that's actually more in use and you can see it's much simpler because the boards don't have to be super complicated. This is from Zingerman's Deli from their purchasing department. Um, this Today's the first day I've looked at this board. So it's kind of interesting to me. It's always interesting to see what groups are measuring, I think. So their total purchases seems like it's important. Missing POs. So sometimes you put things on boards that you're having a problem with. And in open book, they the way it's taught is you can take things on board, off boards, put them on boards. If you're having something new kind of pop up that you want to measure. Labor, dollars found, that must be, you know, if they you know, maybe got better pricing on something. I don't have a clue what SXI is. Um, and then Funergy, that must be their uh, energy um, measure. How much fun were they all having? And support points, I'm not sure quite what that was, but that just shows you that depending on the area there, uh, you can choose metrics that are meaningful to your group. Okay, so briefly, how to get started. Um, I would say if I were starting um, now in a business, I would start with people or an area that I knew were interested in trying it out. So why fight a battle with people who didn't necessarily want to do it? I wouldn't, I wouldn't start there. I would start with people who are really kind of motivated and think it's interesting. I also would start really small. So we saw some really complicated boards and we saw slightly simpler ones. You don't even have to have a whole board. You could start with one metric. You could choose something that you know that everyone cares about or you would love for every or think that everybody should like it could just be sales or it could just be food cost 
or it could be cash. If it was a new business and cash was the main thing that was on people's mind, it could be cash. And another thing that way that you could choose what to start with is you could choose a problem area because hopefully you could make progress and you could show to people that there's really some value in using this system and getting together and working with each other. Uh, one of the toughest things in our bakery has been meeting consistently to do these huddles. And what I always say to managers, because we go through periods here where maybe a department's doing really well and they huddle for several years and then all of a sudden something happens, you know, there's a staffing issues or sales get really crazy and they stop huddling for a few months and it's hard to get the momentum going again. So we have this problem and I say really the most important thing is to meet consistently and meet at a consistent time. So even if you can only meet for five minutes, do it. Meet every week, meet for those five minutes. Uh, and then I I also really highly recommend that if you start this, begin the reporting by having someone who really knows what they're talking about so that people um, get good information and that there are good model and good teachers for people who then take those particular metrics on their own. Uh, sometimes in over the years, we've, we've had people report who don't know it that well, misinformation gets out and also the huddles aren't that effective. So it's not that appealing for people to continue with them. Uh, and then really just build from this point on. And then, you know, if you keep doing these things, maybe you start with one metric, maybe you have a five minute meeting in one area. And then over time, you add metrics, you might add area, different areas of the bakery, different groups of people who want to work on it. And all this, before you know it, you have a, a culture of open book management and people are spending a lot of their time um, talking about the key metrics for your business. So I think that that is all that I hope to share. Mitch I can send it back to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, wow, <laughs> that's all I can say after everything. But one of the things that really resonated with me is the way you all talked about your team members and how important they are too. I mean, we talked about a lot of things, but I was always involved in production more than finance. And I always found that recruiting and training were just so key. And so Scott, I wanted to ask you, you know, with your um, tenure goal in mind, does how does that affect your recruiting? Is is recruit is tenure your tenure goal in your mind when you're recruiting? You know, when when there's a lot of transition, um, the focus is less on the tenure goal and filling the needs with the right people. And in in the end, that's that's the that's the number one goal or the number one priority is that you're finding the right people for the job. Um, and in, in general, what we've had the opportunity to do is that we're, we, until the pandemic, we've always been on the lookout for great people. Um, and if there was someone who was really interested in working with us and it resonated, we would, we would look to invest in the future by bringing them on, even if we weren't exactly ready. Uh, and even though that affected the 10 year goal uh, negatively, you could say. Um, but the goal is to invest in the right people or find the right people so that over time you can achieve that goal. And well, I wanna let everyone know that if you would like to use the chat function or raise your hand and interact directly with our panel, you're, now's the time. So if you have questions, you have a panel of experts. I know I have my questions and I'm, I'm just trying to figure out which ones, but you know, you all have large, staff before pandemic and now you're getting back to that are you concerned about growing hiring too fast too quickly is that a measured response that you're having now or are you just grabbing people as you can anyone try to take that i mean we're unfortunately grabbing people as we can um as i talked about you know, if fill rate is a hugely important thing for us and retaining credibility long term with our with our with our customers, we have to be able to make bread. And this is the first time in 28 years that we can sell more bread than we can make. That's never, ever, 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 ever been a problem. I've always been, you know, beating our sales team over the head with, you know, how do we sell more stuff? How do we sell more stuff? We have this talented group of bakers and we're ready to bake. And now it's sort of the opposite. So yeah, I think unfortunately. We're in a little bit of a situation where we're chasing our tail and, and in the end we need help. 
Um, we have done some equipment investments through COVID to try to, to make certain jobs that are less appealing um, handled through automation. So some packaging equipment, um, some better mixing capacity, panners for things and stuff like that. And so, you know, maybe ideally long-term, we, we won't have to hire the total number of folks back, but, but we're, we're struggling to get people in the door right now and, and we're taking them as they come. And, and I know Scott mentioned before the call, it's hard to take them all on at the same time, but it's also hard not to have them and not be able to make bread. So um, you sort of take the, you take the good with the bad, I guess. We have a question for Amy Emberling from Dan Torici, Tortorici. Um, did the visibility of the data help to avoid layoffs at some level during the pandemic? Uh, I'm not sure that the visibility helped to avoid the layoffs because the visibility just showed, you know, what the circumstances were. And if the circumstances aren't good, they're not good whether they're visible or not. I think what they what it does, what the visibility did though, or can do is that uh, there's a lot of trust, and um, and there are, and it helps with avoiding surprises. So people have been seeing the numbers for years; they understand them, and then as they would had seen them change, they understood what they meant and what the implications of them were, and that if there were layoffs, which uh, there there really weren't, you know, what happened for us is a lot of people. Uh, were very frightened, as I imagine was the case in different parts of the country. And uh, quite a few people just took themselves out of the situation and decided they just wanted to stay home, which, you know, I, I was glad that they could do that. And I'm glad that our government provided unemployment. Um, and it also meant that we didn't have to lay people off, which I was also um, grateful for. But I think it, it seeing the number, numbers en engenders trust and, um, and also a sense of power in that you know, people understand what they possibly can do to help to change the situation. You used the word ownership before and that really struck a chord with me because I, I remember those meetings and, and those, those numbers when I worked at Zingerman's and you're right, I, I, I felt like I was engaged and part of the team. Uh, we have another question from Brian Wood. If it's Brian Wood in the Bay Area, the Queen of Monster, um, do any of you track wages by exempt and non-exempt? If so, what are some of the percentages you aim for? Great question, Brian. So do you track your percentages of, on the exempt and the non-exempt earners? Awesome. Uh, percentage of wages, do you divide them out like that or do you just have an overall percentage? Um, I'll speak up for a moment. We don't really separate them out, but with the laws in New York, there've been, um, they really have tried to make more employees um, non-exempt. So they're mostly hourly employees and our bakery is, you know, 95% of that. And in a way it's gotten easier because we just, they're all in the same category now. So mm -hmm. I think we look at it more across the board and um, we don't have as many people in the non-exempt because it's not, we don't have as many managers, but they also have tried to um, put in some controls within the New York Department of Labor so that the minimum wage has to be very high to be a non-exempt employee. So, um, you know, it's, it's pretty interesting, but it's actually, I think, beneficial to be more hourly. It seems like for us, it's gone in the positive direction. So we're happy about that. It's, you kind of control your labor costs more by knowing your hours and by knowing the amount of work and you create a schedule that's a little tighter and more reasonable for everybody that way. That's what we try to do. So, and question also about bringing back people and just hiring anybody. Like we're really being careful and we're trying to bring back people one by one to be um, putting together the best team we can and the strongest team and people that really wanna be here that are caring and they really care about their production, their quality. I mean, the products we're making are really beautiful right now because we've got such a great team and we've got those longevity people like I'd say like three fourths of them are eight years and over. They've just been here forever and they really love being part of the company. So we've really, you know, brought back this great team of people. And, and when we add new people, I think they really respect all the history and they're being very respectful of their elders and doing things right. So it's 
been good so far. Yeah, and when you have all those employees like you're describing, your customers might not realize that's the direct cause, but they're realizing it in the product. They're lucky, yeah, they love the product. Yeah. So product complaints are down, so that's good. <laughs> that's always great, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we have any more questions coming in? Um, just a couple of phrases that caught me. Josh, when you said what gets measured gets managed, I mean, I, we all know it's true, but it's just so succinct that it, it really hit me hard and um, over-promising and under, versus under-delivering. Uh, great way to look at things. You know, I always had the production view and not the financial view. And that's why I was always getting called to the office probably. But um, these, this is very helpful um, because not everybody has a big business and everything you've said today, um, it could scale down or up. So it's very helpful information. I don't see any more questions coming. Here we go. Oh, Alexander Holbrook, thank you all for sharing your knowledge. Great discussion. So I think we're headed to the end, if that's all that's coming in. Thank you, everyone, for just sharing your knowledge, experience, and culture with us, because uh, I think all three of those are really important in the discussion today, and hopefully everyone can take a message from that and take lessons and move forward. Josh, Amy, Amy, Scott, thank you so much. Uh, thank everyone for attending. And just, I just wanna remind everyone that blood donations are really down everywhere. If you can get to your local blood center and donate, it's really needed right now. So with that said, thanks for a great discussion and I'll see you next time. Bye everyone, thank you so much.